Any questions about scopes? Scopes of uh, variables and entities that we create. We're good with scopes. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, we cannot have a global scope just by itself. Okay. When you create a verse, so the question was, since you didn't have a microphone, I have to repeat. So the question was, what is the difference between externing a header file and creating an actual, uh, actual variable in a header file? It seems to be working the same way. The answer is, except it's not. Uh, if we go back to, I think at the time, at some time, I, I talked about how compiler works, didn't I? Um, let me see if I have the thing over here. Yeah, I do actually have it. So what happens if in the 2.cpp I create a variable? Let's say integer a in 2.h. It gets included over here. What does an include do? My friend with a <laughs> what does an include hashtag include? What does it do? What does include do? Like, what, what, is, what does include do? If you're not ready, just pass it to the next person. Don't worry. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, what does include do? Basically a copy-paste. It basically, it's a copy-paste and nothing but that, right? Copy-paste, copy you pass it to the next person, right? As soon as you answer, you pass it to the next person. So... Basically, it, it copies and pastes. When does this copy-paste happen? Timely. Before, it is compiled. before compilation. Fantastic. So before 2.cpp is compiled, and 3.cpp is compiled, and 4.cpp is compiled, before each of them, one copy of the header file will be added at the beginning of this. And we had an integer i in the header file, right? Now we have one integer a over here, Completely different one over here, and another one over here. Three integer A's in 2.cpp, 3.cpp, 4.cpp, each one with a file scope that have nothing to do with each other. You set one to something, the other one's not going to change. Of course. If it's not a constant value, in 5.cpp you can change it. Extern is essentially a prototype for a variable. Let's call it for an object because it doesn't have to be a primitive type. It could be anything. So, for example, you're printing something on C, C out in one file. If you go print another thing on C out in the other file, will it forget which line it printed on? No. C out is an external variable. It's an external object. It gets declared only once and prototyped everywhere it's being used. So essentially, you are telling to the linker, okay, you're telling to the linker the, I don't know, tax constant, uh, uh, double, uh, the constant value tax that is externed. When I refer to it, I mean the one that is done in, in one.cpp. So essentially, one creation many accesses between accesses between files that are included okay it's it's as if you have one person and it's being introduced in many different places okay all right so so that's the difference why we have uh, 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 external and not just repeating because repeating is not really anything like that yes Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. We have no idea what that is, but sure, singleton. Okay. All right. Go Google it. All right. Am I recording? Hopefully, I'm recording. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So that's that one. So that was the. Uh,
I no, it's actually recording, but I don't know if the audio is being recorded. I forgot to test it. <laughs> Hopefully it is. Let's hope for the best. Actually, um, should I? How can I test it when it's actually recording? I have no idea. Ah, that's okay. It should work. Mine is not, and these are all. Yeah, we're okay. We're okay. Nothing has changed since last time, so. We talked about type def. We talked about uh, how includes our uh, preprocessor directives and how compiler works and all the good stuff like that. Then we talked about static variables and static methods. Um, so static variables, um, do you remember what static variables were by any chance? He has a talking stick. <laughs> static variable? Um. The variable doesn't die. That's it. The, the variable doesn't die. As soon as it gets created, it gets initialized right at the beginning. Uh, uh, wherever it's getting initialized, it gets initialized over there. And the value remains, or it, it's kept on, unless it's changed, but it, the value never gets wiped out until the program ends. So we can say it like this. Static variables have global lifetime, but limited scope. Global lifetime, limited scope. It can only be seen in their scope, but their value remains global all the way through the program uh, that is going through. All right. And we created static value. Yes, sir. That was a very philosophical question. A static variable shadow itself? Yeah, so basically, so basically, say like, he kind of like initialized that, like, like, You can't initialize. Sorry. You, can, you initialize once. Initialization is assignment at the moment of creation. Yeah. So wherever the static variable, static object, whatever it is, is being initialized, that's the place it gets its first value. In other places, you don't have initialization anymore. You're yeah. setting it, which so means you're, you're assigning values. Yes. So, like for example, if we assign it, assign a value like after we declare, like kind of like after we just initialization. Yes. And then we assign like another value. Okay. It overrides the old it just, one. Like, overrides yeah. It's just. Yeah, it's just a variable that doesn't die. It keeps the last value that it has. Now you change that value, the last value becomes the one that you changed it. All right, and uh, we demonstrated it in, in uh, uh, so uh, let me just give you a very quick example for it. So just to have a quick review on what we had, in here I have a, a static variable that is the set in function fa, and it is initialized to zero. Therefore, the first time fa is being hit, it's going to be 0. And then after that, it keeps the value. So I print it and I add another one, where this one over here, integer a, is just a regular variable, which means every time foo is hit, it gets recreated, set to a value, and then goes through. So what, I, what I'm doing over here is just calling foo once, which has a variable and a loop. And the other one, I'm calling for 10 times, OK? And that 10 times could be, OK? It doesn't matter. Just 10 times. You know what I mean, right? So because I call it 10 times, so essentially what happens is that uh, the first execution that goes through over here, when it goes to the function foo, because the variable is the very vari local variable, the variable runs, that's IPC144, OK? <laughs> so it runs it, and, and it prints the, the thing. It, let's put it over here, and this one over here. OK, so it runs the thing. But the interesting part is the next one, which I actually revisit function for 10 times. So when I actually come over here, I go in here, the first time s becomes 0. It adds 1, it prints it, adds 1 to it, so now S is 1. When it comes out over here and goes back in, it actually returns the value. So the value is kept, and now it's 1. It becomes 2, 3, and it keeps going like that. So the static variable is holding its value. 
So that was a regular static variable that has nothing to do with C++. It's a C feature. Okay? So that's C. It has nothing to do with C++. We're good down to this point. All right. So the next thing, so A, static review. The next thing we want to talk about would be properties. What the devil is that? You. All right, so the next thing, uh, are uh, static member function and static member variables that we went through. So when you have static member functions and static member variables, the story becomes a bit different, which brings us to this. So say as, as we mentioned, say I have a container and then I have a counter and I set the counter to CNT. We mentioned uh, in uh, that the, they call static member variable, I think it's from Visual Basic. Uh, I think they, they, they call it shared variables, okay? Uh, because it makes sense. When you create a member variable that is static, it becomes a shared value between all instances of the class. Something really surprising happened in OP244. I have to test it over here too. Uh, so what is the meaning of instantiation? Instantiation, what does it mean? Instance of something. Or anyone. The heck with the microphone. Anyone, what is not you? Uh, uh, I, want, I want people who answered, didn't answer much. What is instantiation? You, you talk to someone else. Come on. People who didn't talk. Actually, pass the microphone to the gentleman over there. He's going to tell us what instance is. What does it mean, an instance, without Googling it? <laughs> What is the meaning of instance? Instantiating something. Pass to the next person. This is the same surprise that I had. So I'm using the word instantiate over and over. And everybody does this, and literally no one knows what it is. Uh, well, how about you? Um, uh, can you give me an example? Like, I don't no. Know. I'm instant. <laughs> uh, what is the meaning of instantiation? Give it to the next person. Um, do you, when you mean instantiating, do you mean like how like we make objects? Like we instantiate an object to create something. Ah, so probably you knew, but like instantiate. So when I say an instance of car is car C, C becomes an instance of car. Integer I, I is an instance of uh, integer, right? Are we good with this? Are we okay? No surprises over there. So when I say it's a shared value between instances of the object, it means I have Container A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E are instances of container. The value M, C, and T is shared between these. There is one C and T shared between all objects, all instances of the class container. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? All right. So uh, that was my surprise. And, and you'll see that like, well, it's interesting. So an instance essentially means you create something and you have an instance of it. For instance, you see, it means <laughs> it's uh, an example of an object. Uh, say an instance of an object, a representative of an object. So that's that. And another. Uh, so, uh, but the problem with the shared and in C plus plus, they call that class variables too, because you can actually access them using the class because there is no specific owner for it. When you have five instances of an object, each one have access to the variable, right? Because of that, you can actually use the class handle instead of a variable name. So instead of saying it container A, B, C, and they say A dot M underline C and T, you can actually say container scope resolution M underline C and T. You can access if it was public, it's not. But if it was public, you could access the shared variable at line number five using the class handle rather than the variable handle, rather than the instance handle. 
Okay? Because it's, it belongs to the class, not to the instance. When you create a compound type, what is a compound type? Uh, well, put together yeah. was the key, yeah. <laughs> so, so put together, so putting many things, so he, this is a compound type because it has a data and a CNT. It, it puts two things together. It becomes compound. Anything that is made up of more than one thing, it, it's, it's a compound type. An array is a compound type, right? Okay. So, yeah. So anyway, so uh, because uh, it, it, it's called a class variable, because in a compound type when you actually uh, create uh, uh, you create a compound type, you have one design, one class, and out of, a, out of that class you can have hundreds of instances. Therefore, class is unique. Because class is unique, it has direct access to the static variables because static variables are unique between the instances of the object. We good? And in when you want to set an alignment, two seconds, when you want to set an alignment in, uh, uh, in C in and C out, you set, what was I think, C out dot, uh, uh, to do alignment set, and then what do you put? IOS, iOS what? Scope resolution, left. Yeah. That means left is a static variable inside the IOS class and accessible by all instances of, of iOS. Therefore, when you set it to left, everybody shares the leftness of the O stream. Got it? That's what it was. So the, all those things I use, scope resolution, they, they are class variables. They are static variables. They are flags that are created so it can be shared by all instances of IO stream. Somebody had a question? Yes. Okay, two questions. <laughs> oh, you have it? Okay. Because I, I want people to hear If it's close to you, then. Okay, so arrays are comp compound types, but let's say our derived class compound types, because they also have like um, their parent class as well. And then afterwards, so like basically what uh, Gordon said also, that's compound types, yeah. right? Okay, so that's that's true? Yes. All right. Um, next up, the question. Okay, so on one of your pre recorded lectures, right, um, I noticed that like, Without being so you're actually commenting something I said a year ago. A year ago. Yeah. Holy oh, moly! <laughs> I'll try to use my identity memory. Okay, for so that. um, I noticed that like you use a static function from another class on another class, but the thing is the other class wasn't like derived. What wasn't like related to the didn't have like any instance to like the class with the static function. At all. Um, oh, well, well, give me a second that we get to that example. Okay. You're going a little ahead uh, okay. of your thing. Well, I'm going to give an example out of that um, one right now. Okay. Well, because you have seen previous lectures, you know what I'm about to say, and you have a question about it. All right. I, I'm going to block those uh, lectures. <laughs> it's causing me trouble. Anyway, so yeah. So, so, and again, as you notice, I'm not rushing through this at all. I don't want to rush through this. I want us to start with a strong base. And I was actually mentioning it to the other class, so, uh, and actually <laughs> it was amazing. One of the OP244 students came to the uh, podium and said, sir, and I said, could you please teach us a little bit about syntax of OP244 <laughs> on C++? And I'm like, wait, my friend, the, the syntax is going to come. And, and uh, so yeah, so don't worry about it. We. Um, um, in OP244, in IPC, in uh, OP345, um, uh, if this is uh, the progress in semester, and this is the amount of information that is coming in, this is the pace of material you will see. Okay, okay, so that's so at the beginning, enjoy your time because I'm trying to build up the bases. When I go speed of light, you're not going to get scared, okay? So, so this is this is when we are dealing with multi threading, okay? All right, <laughs> which is running five applications at the same time, or not five, 5,000 applications at the same time, parallel. So, 
so be with me, okay? So, what did I do? All right. Okay. All right, so, um, so that's because I, I was about to say this, and it took like nine hours to get to that point. Because, because these class variables, these class variables don't belong to any of the instances, constructors can send them, set them. Because each object has the constructor of its own to build its own property. This is no one's property. You cannot set them in a constructor. That's a very common mistake. In my constructor, I can modify its value, but I cannot initialize it. To initialize it, I have to get out of the class, use the scope resolution, and actually say the integer in the container called mcnt will be initialized to zero. This initialization happens at compile time type of a thing. It's a lie, but it's, yeah. When the program starts running, CNT is zero, without any instances of the class actually created. So the first instance that gets created has a CNT as zero. Yes, sir. Um, so if we want to instantiate the counter value here, mm -hmm. do we have to create the class and then outside of its scope do this? Yeah. Um, there's no way of setting it. No. Because the, whatever you have inside the class, it is, is it expl it is, it's explaining how the objects are going to look like. And objects have no, nothing to do with the. So we have, are we good down to this point? Right now I'm going to say something that's going to kind of go woohoo. OK. So uh, when you create a variable, what happens? That variable actually occupies some piece of memory. And it, it's flagged, it's set with a name that you refer with that handle and you put something in it, right? Okay, when you create a function, the exact same thing happens. A piece of memory gets allocated and some data goes into that piece of memory and a handle is created so you can access its values. That handle is the function name. So variable, function, potatoes, potatoes. In a variable, you have data that you manipulate. In a function, you have data that you execute. But they are both data. And you will see soon that you can actually extract the address of a, of a function and call a function using a pointer. Pass the logic between stuff, because it's an address in memory. I can get its address and pass it to another thing if I want to. Right? So keep that in mind. Because of that fact, you can actually have static functions, which means become a function that doesn't belong to any specific object, to any specific instance, but it belongs to the class. Okay? And static functions and static number va variables, they have a one-to-many relationship. In a one-to-many relationship, one can access all. Many don't know how to take care of the one, OK? Which means, um, let, me, let me explain what happens. So my apologies, the, the exact opposite. One-to-many, one can read all, OK? But cannot access to modify all, because it doesn't know which one it's dealing with, OK? So what happens is that if you have a static variable, and inside static variable you try to access any non-static thing, it can't. Because there are 50 of it, 5,000 of it. It doesn't know which one you're dealing with. But many, they all have access to one, therefore they can access it. OK? So because of this fact, Static member functions cannot access regular functions of a class, member functions of a class. A static number of instance cannot call the display because it doesn't know which display. If I have five objects, I have five displays. I don't know which one to call. But display can show number of, can access number of instance because there's only one and they all can access it. 
Static member functions can access static member variables. No problem. They are both one. It's one-to-one -one relationship. Okay? Are we good? It's exactly as if you're standing in a hallway and I tell you, get into class. And you look, you see there are five classes. Say, which one? But if you are in a class, I tell you, go to hallway, you simply walk out to the hallway. There is one hallway. Does that make sense? All right. So the example over here for the container we have is actually telling that I have three containers. And so essentially, I can actually keep track of how many things I have. That's a beautiful example for it. In the constructor, I'm adding one to the CNT that shows how many objects I have. In the destructor, I'm removing one. So I can keep track of how many containers I have. OK, it becomes very handy, OK, especially when you're doing uh, anyways, yeah, so you can actually see how many objects do you have. Are we good? Okay? All right. Uh, we already ran this, so in here I'm going to call it B static methods review. Actually, let me run it to see if it runs. Shoot, too late. Uh, Copy. It should be somewhere around here. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, this output. Actually, I'm going to ask it to create a new one. That's easier. There we go. Okay. Sorry, this. There. That's better. Okay. So now we have it. Let's look at the other things we need to talk about. We talked about uh, the arguments that main accept accepts. Anybody wants a, a review on that? We know um, the main accepts an integer and a pointer of. Uh, C strings. We talked about it in class, correct? So the first one tells you how many uh, stuff are in the command line. So when we are, so so when I write something like this, I think I need using name. Oh, yeah, there you go. So when I write something as, like this, this tradition to call argc, argc, you can call it a, but don't, OK? Like if you do it like that, it's like you're broken a holy rule, OK? <laughs> so argc is called its number of count, counter for arguments, the number of arguments you have on the command line. And the name of the executable is one of them. So at minimum one, it can never be zero. For something to get executed, you have to ex type its name and hit enter, right? The rest, if it's two, three, four, five, it's got to def so, so this is an array of a C string. OK, so you have a pointer to a C string, which means it's a two-dimensional array, which means a 0 holds a C string that is the name of the executable. A1 is the next argument, A2 is the next argument, so on and so forth. And your uh, uh, workshops are going to work like this. You will see that. But how, like if I just run it now as is, you will see that it's going to show me what the compiler uses to execute my program. Woohoo, that's one. You see, so it actually essentially D uses parallax, and it goes September 15 EXE. That's the whole thing is first argument. All right, so to how do I uh, set for debugging the values for this so I can not go to command line and keep typing? I want to have pass arguments to it. So what you go, you go to the project. In project, you go to the properties. In properties, you go to debugging. And here, you put command line arguments. So in here, if I say one, two, tie your shoe, if I do something like this, 
I have one, two, three, four, five arguments passing as if I'm saying yada, yada, yada dot exe, and then after that, one, two, three, four, five, okay? So these are the arguments that are passed to the command line when it's getting executed. And if I run the program, now you will see that I have one, two, three, so you want to tie your shoes. So that's the first argument, second, third, and so on and so forth. Yes? Okay, okay. So, so, why not? I don't understand what's wrong. It, it has nothing to do with searching anything. It's just a value that is coming to the function. Now, if you do that, you have value as a file and try to open it. By default, the current directory is the place that's going to look at it. It has nothing. What comes in is irrelevant. How to use it and how your program logic is uses it, using it. That's the point. So it doesn't make any difference. Yes, sir. No. Yes, it is, it is a two-dimensional array. So it's essentially an array of pointer to characters, an array of pointer to characters, and each pointer to character is pointing to an all-terminated array of strings. No. Okay. Okay. Array of pointers. Array of pointers. So as this is what it is. I think this is back to 244 type of a thing. Uh, should I, uh, let me just, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to try and draw this. I'm using my finger to draw this, so my apologies for, uh, uh, so this is your argv. Okay. It's a pointer, right? And it points to an array. Each element of this array is a character pointer. And each one of this is, connect, is connected, is pointing to an individual array somewhere in memory. Null terminated array. The syntax for it, when you access it, appears two-dimensional, but it's not two-dimensional. A two-dimensional array is essentially one-dimensional array that is cut up into segments. So in two-dimensional array, your first row and a second row has identical rows. In here, it doesn't. So the syntax is two-dimensional, which means if you want to access the... So in our case, this is going to be the name of the file, which is the exe. Oh my god, I love my handwriting. Okay, let me just... So this is the exe, whatever it is, okay? This one is going to be 1. This one is going to be 2. And this one is going to tie. I'm not going to type the rest. Your shoe, whatever. So each one has separate thing. So if you want to access the second element of the second pointer, what you need to write is argv1. That's the pointer, correct? Then another square bracket for that pointer to go to the array to the index. The syntax looks two-dimensional. but And it is two-dimensional, but not in a conventional way. It's a dynamic two-dimensional array. So the, another syntax for this, get ready, is this. Got it? It's a character, why? Well, it's a character pointer. Pointer. What is an integer pointer holding? Can hold an array of integers, right? What does a character pointer hold? An array of characters, right? What does a character pointer pointer holds? 
an array of character pointers. We're going to come to pointer to pointers. You'll see that, like a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer. We can do that. There's no problem with it. It's, it's a recursive if, if you understand the concept. When I, when I do that, we'll go, oh my god, pointer to a pointer. No, that's not the case. That's, that's, so imagine a tree. If you break a branch, it's a tree. If you break another branch out of it, it's a tree. If you break another branch, they are all trees, but just smaller portions. The concept of pointers are the same. Pointer to a pointer is not a scary thing. It's just address of a variable of type pointer. OK? So they are all the same. It's, not, it's a recursive definition, so you can actually get it very easily if you apply it in a recursive manner. We are going very slow. OK, so that's the argv, as if I'm teaching this for the first time. So argv review. Argv review. I think you never want to have that quiz, do you? Uh, OK. <laughs> that's a good idea, yeah. <coughs> OK. And the next one was env, that we said env uh, is, the, uh, is the, the, the variable that, that uh, is the, uh, what shall we call it, the, uh, uh, the third argument of main that is, again, uh, a pointer of character pointers. But the difference is that, as you see, this one doesn't have a length. Why? Because it's a null term character pointer pointer, which means it, it's pointing to an array of pointers, and the last one is a null pointer. So because the number of arguments, the, uh, the number of environment variables in your, in your computer is like, you don't know how many do you have, right? So if I actually run this now, you will see that everything that I have in my computer is actually set over here. All the things, so this is the path. Uh, you want to know what is like you know, the number of processors, like how, how, what do I have, and what is the name of the, 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 the computer, what is the home, like for example, if you want to know where is the uh, operating system lies, then you have the home drive. If you want to know who's the user that is logged in, what is the log, every single information that you want from your computer, they are in environment variables. Do that in Linux and you're going to be surprised the number of things that are going to come out. And, and study them. It's good for you. Like, um, yeah. So I can, I can, in a test, I can write you something like this. Write a program that will not get executed if it's renamed from abc. How do you do it? You get the first argument. And if it doesn't end with abc. renamed executable. Then you're going to say, sorry, you renamed the executable. I cannot run this. And you quit the program. Don't run it. Right? So it runs, but it just doesn't execute. OK? You can do all the good stuff. Or you can make sure that the user that is running it has specific user ID. OK? Somewhere in here, I know there is a user ID, too. Program files, module, username, Farda. OK? That's Windows. It doesn't care what your name is. Just put something over. So yeah, so that's the username. All right? And where is the user profile? And uh, like, where is the documents and stuff? You can always like that. Anyway, so now you know. So, and you can do that on, uh, you can run this on Linux, and you're going to get the same thing. Uh, are we OK with this? So as you see over here, I'm stopping when E and the I becomes null. If this is not null, it keeps going. That, that's the null termination key. Yes. I would love to go back to the Bell director, Bell Labs, 60 years ago and ask them why they did it. But that's how they created the language. I have no idea. OK. I'm sorry. But yeah. That's C. So another use of static functions. Why you use static methods? Sometimes what you do in a class is relative to the class, but it has nothing to do with the object. You follow what I'm saying? Sometimes you are writing a class. In that class, you need to do few stuff that is not in the abstraction of the object. 
which means it's not one of the things that that object do in a real world. It's in your abstraction. But it's some kind of a tool that you need to accomplish those stuff. You don't need five different copies out of it. It's something that has nothing to do with the class. But you need to do it. You have done this many times in your OOP244, if you were my student or, uh, yeah. So, and this is the example for it. Remember the allo copy that we did? It's to do dynamic memory allocation. It has nothing to do with the class name. Name has nothing to, doesn't know what dynamic memory allocation is. I just want a logic so I can do dynamic memory allocation and don't repeat it over and over. So I created a static void allo copy, which means it becomes a class function now. And, it, and these type of things usually have no access to the properties of a class, which they are not supposed to. This is supposed to do dynamic memory allocation for anything. Maybe I had over here a last name. Maybe I had over here an address. And each one is supposed to have dynamic memory allocation done for it. I want to do that and encapsulate it. Either I can create the separate utilities class, or if it's something that I just want to do over here, and I, and I know that it has nothing to do with my class, I'll do it over there. So as you see, this static thingy uses allocopy as a regular thing. But that has nothing to do with the, with, the, uh, with the name. It's just a utility used for the name. Is that a question? Yes. Are you able to make a static method perfect? Holy moly. Static method. The answer is I don't know. I have to. I have to. I'm just trying to go through the logic of virtuality and see, does that apply to a, to a static member function? I have never done it. Never came handy. OK, there you go. Was that ChatGPT? <laughs> so it cannot be. So I really, because I've never done it, it never came. Well, these, like usually the things that I don't know, 90% they can't be done because I have never encountered it in 20 years. Otherwise, I would have someplace, right? I don't know. I have to still, I, for that 10%, I have doubt. I'm going to go check it myself, too. But I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. But maybe it makes sense. I don't know. I have to check it out. But anyway, so that's that. So that's uh, 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 when, so everybody understands what this thing is doing, right? It's just a, it just automates the dynamic memory allocation for me so I don't have to repeat it over and over. So if I had other stuff that I needed to do with dynamic memory allocation, instead of carrying a toolbox with me, I just put one function in here. Why you're not satisfied with this? You're okay with this? Oh, because you look angry. I'm like, what the hell is that? Okay, all right. All right. This is one of the things that I love about in-person classes and I hate about online classes. With online classes, I have to keep polling you and probably you called your sister, sit over here, anything comes up, you say yes. Okay? So, and then you go. So, you did that, didn't you? <laughs> it was your daughter, right? <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, but what I'm saying is that, yeah, for here, I can actually look at people's faces and kind of talks to me, so. Um, yes. That, repeat that again. You were kind of right, but I didn't get it completely. Yes, but so 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 it's for it's so I'm so the example is not very good actually. You're right because allocation and copying can be done for any class. Yes. But let's say. I wanted to do a validation that was specifically for a name, okay? A validation of data that has nothing to do with what real names are outside in outside world, or something that I wanted to test that is 
specifically a utility feature that I want to add to my class. It has nothing to do with the class's abstraction. Who has the talking stick? Do yeah. you remember what abstraction was? The abstraction, what do I mean? I know everybody knows what it means, but when you ask them for some reason 50 times, we started from beginning of 244, and I asked this, I think, at least 20 times, and every time people, yeah. Uh, okay, you didn't answer, I know, so give it to him. So do you remember what abstraction was, like when we said abstraction? Okay, anybody wants to come to help? Come for, come to help? Okay, what is abstraction? And then pass it to the next person. Abstraction is when you only focus on what you need. And you ignore everything else. Yeah. So based on your abstraction, your class may be different in different scopes, right? One person's name has serves different purpose than next one's gonna be you. Your lead didn't skip it though. Yeah, so so that's what's gonna happen, right? So so as you mentioned, you want you want to write something that you don't know, like whenever you submit, should I make this private or public? And then the question goes out of that. Should I even put this in class or not? Private and public is one, de one decision that you want to make when you're designing your class. Is this thing accessible to everyone? And they say, no, it cannot be. Only this class is using it. And then you look at it, it says, but that has nothing to do with a name. And that's when you make it a utility, you make it a, yeah, OK? Verifying a date, like you have a date class and you have to verify. Uh, Sky's the limit. Many things, yes, yeah. many, many things. So what I do usually, you remember in OP244, I created the utils class, and like C out, I externed it. So I would do ut dot, and I would call those simply, all those things could be static, static functions. Like when I'm doing, doing an str len, str len could be a static function, right? Yes. No, because I had to instantiate it. If you make it static, you don't need to. You simply say util scope resolution SDRN. And then say you say use, then you do a using for utils, and then you don't you use anything. So it's, it's like, so you can actually use a static class. Yes? Yeah. Oops. No, 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 no. Okay, how is a function called? When you are calling a function, so if I write over here, int allocate, so I, I want to write a function to allocate series of integers. I write integer pointer nums. And in here, integer uh, size t size. Are we good with this? Yeah. We okay with this? All right. So now in here, I'm going to do void. I don't need that. So in here, I'm going to say nums is set to new int size, correct? So that allocates it. Are you good? All right. So let's do this. In here, I'm going to say um, integer pointer n, OK? And then I'm going to say allocate n and 30. Are we good with this? Why is it giving me an error? Oh, allocate. Stupid compiler. OK. <laughs> OK. So are we OK with this? Everybody's OK with this? Any problem with this? Yeah, lots of problem is what you say no lots of problem with this so if i say over here for integer i set to zero and i less than 30 and i plus plus and if i ran this and i said n i is set to i everything should be okay right and then if i do, obviously i'm going to delete it afterwards if i run this program this is what's going to happen oh build errors for what no. Oh. Uh, I 
have a remedy for that that is very quick. Actually, forget it. Um, uh, define CRT uh, secure no warnings, right? That was the thing, I think. Okay, shit, god damn it. Okay, so now we're going to have this. Well, the funny thing is it didn't crash. That's Windows stuff to everybody, by the way. If it was any other thing, it would have actually blown to heavens right now. But it didn't crash. So let me just explain to you. I was expecting it to crash, but it didn't. And I said, that's funny, actually. Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about it. So <clears throat> when a function is called, how is a function called? The function is called like this, allocate. And then what it does, it calls the function integer pointer, nums, and it sets it to n, correct? OK, and the other one is size, size, t, size, and is set to 30. It's initialized to 30. That's how the function is called. Do we agree with this? Yeah. All right. So in your allocate, when the allocate is called, this is your n. Again, I have to use my artistic uh, skills. So this is uh, nums, right? And this is n. Are we okay with this? So you are putting the value inside n into nums. Is that correct? Correct? So num is pointing to garbage. Now nums are going to point to garbage. Are we okay with this? All right. After this, you go to function, it sets the nums to a new array of integers, correct? What it has to do with your n? Is your n set to anything? Did you allocate anything in n? No, no. No, yes, you are passing the address by value. This is something that we have to understand, people. Nothing is passed by address in C language. Nothing. No function can ever be called passing anything by address, ever. You can pass an address to a function. That address is passed by value. You are creating a new variable called nums, happens to be an address. And it's a copy of the address you have in main. Two different things. How can I make this become this? I have to make it a reference. Now, if I actually put over here a reference, And thank you for that question. That means like half of you probably had that problem. And if I make this a reference now, now no variable is created in here. Nums become a new name for n. Therefore, your allocation. So num and names are potatoes and potatoes. Now the allocation happens for n. So th this doesn't exist anymore. So that doesn't exist anymore. Actually, it's, it, I have to even go further back. So when you actually call it, this is n and nums at the same time. They are not two different variables. Yes? Same principle like file in C. How do you use a double pointer? Yes, 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 yes. Double pointers, yeah, sure. Exactly. Everybody knows that. <laughs> are we good? All right. That's why in that thingy over there, so that's why in that thingy over there, I had to pass the reference to set it, to do dynamic memory. Thank you for the question. Are we good? 
Class is almost over, and I haven't finished the review of the last class yet. All right. Okay, so that's that. So we have done this. Uh, D reference review uh, and static stuff. Okay, yeah. Anyway, so we know that. Okay, um, I'm going to go quick about these things. These are the things that you need to know. Be extremely careful when you're dealing with literals. Be extremely careful when you're dealing with literals. Literal values are as follows. When you put a literal value just like that, it's base 10. When you put a zero in front of it, we're not just Q, but it's zero at the beginning. This actually becomes base 8, which is 1, 8, and a 7. So the term is 15, not 17. Okay, be careful. That's a bug. Lots of people say it's a three digit thing, so I'm going to write everything from zero so I remember it. If you do that, you'll, go, you'll be in trouble. Careful. And 0x is base 16. Everybody knows that, right? It means 1, 16, and a 7. Good? So that's that one. Careful with this. So in here, C, D, E. Careful with base 8. <clears throat> Common mistake in... For somebody probably Googled size off and they mistaken that thing with string length. Okay, size off has nothing to do with length of any strings. Uh, who has this talking? So who's this, what is a string? Do you remember what the string is? C string, sorry. Remember what the C string was in 244? C string? Yes. Uh -huh. Actually, you already, you already talked, right? No, you didn't. Go, give it to him. Give uh, it to him. String is like a number of characters together. The string is an array of characters, which is, okay? So a string, there is no such a thing as a C string. C string just is just the standard we follow, which is terminating the data with a null. Size of has nothing to do with that. Size of gives you the memory, something allocates it. So if it's a variable or if it's a type in any way. In the same scope, if you do a size of, it's going to give you size of one integer multiplied by 10. So if your integer is 8 bytes, it's going to give you 80. Okay? But if you pass that integer to a function using a pointer, go inside the function, you do a size of of that, the answer is always 8. That is a size of a pointer. Because it tells you what is the size of that variable. It has nothing to do with the array. Are we okay with this? Having said that, we need to understand how we actually <clears throat> align our variables when we create compound types. Okay? What is the, if the double is 8 bytes, what is the size of coordinates over here? 16. 16. What is the size of coordinate over here? So I have 8, 8, 8, and uh, 1. 25, we think. Okay? That's not the case. By, by, it's, it's a very complicated thing. Like, you see these three things? They all have a character and a double and an integer. But the size of them in memory is different. Why? C language, C plus, uh, computer science work, computers work like this. When you're dealing with characters, address could be anything because size of a character is one. So next character is always sitting at, at, at the next address. So if you, you, you go one character, it goes to the next address, correct? But when you have an integer with, let's say, size four, if you are at address zero, where is the next integer? Address 4. When is the next one? 8. Where is the next one? So you cannot have an address of an integer to be 31. It can't be. Compiler cannot do that. You cannot lose the alignment of things. And it's a very complicated thing. 
your brain cannot, like, if you closely go through it and follow the rules that the compiler and the system and operating system is going, you may get it. But it, because it was very difficult, they created these two things. One is size up, the other one is align. Alignment tells you what coefficient of address this thing can take in. Okay? Seriously, I, I studied math, but not in English. Um, what, what multiplies of number it can actually sit in? Okay? So, uh, pardon me? Multiple city. Multiple city. Whatever. So, essentially, it tells you is the address divisible to the address that you can actually sit in and everything sits on their proper things, which means if you have a structure that has a character and a double and, a, and an integer, the int, it has to be set in a way that the integer must always sit on address that is multiplied by 4 and the double must always sit in an address that is multiplied by 8 and one character can sit anywhere. And just imagine inside another structure, and that one inside another structure, and everything must fit properly. So it readjusts and sets everything in a way that you can't imagine. <coughs> so if I go through size of all these in here, it's not going to work because I'm the wrong file. Okay, so <laughs> control A, copy Z. Okay, this is the last one. So yeah, as I was saying, when you run this, run for its run type of a thing. So as you see, this one is 16. You were right. But this one is 32. OK? This one, the first test, is 24. But the next test is 16. And they are exactly the same number of variables in them. Why? Because this one is starting with a character and then a double. So it has to create a character. Skip seven bytes so the double can actually sit at an address that is multiplies of eight. Then it has to put an integer. Integer can sit after. And then the size of the whole thing. Then it has to decide if I put the second test after that in an array. All the addresses correct still? If everything is good, then you're fine. So this process to be in a safe side Always start your variable from the biggest one to the smallest one. Like that, you lose the least amount of memory. Okay? So when you're actually creating something like in here, I still have 16 bytes, right? In here. So I have a double that is 8, I have an integer that is 4, and I have a character that is 1. So 8, 4, 12, I have 13. So in here, if I created an array of three characters, it would have still be the same, <laughs> right? So if, so if you are confined with memory, like you're, 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 you're short in memory and you create a structure, you can still squeeze a few data, some data in there uh, and, and use it. So careful with that, right? So that's that one. And it's the same thing with the alignment. The alignment of, so this one is size off, and again, it has nothing to do, people, with, let me just show you this so you know. So um, integer uh, void foo character pointer string uh, c out size of str. And in here, let's say character str 1000. So that is uh, size in foo. Just to kind of have an essence of what I was talking about, in here I'm going to say foo out. Size of s. So this one is 
in main. So if I run this beautiful program of mine, you'll see this is, oh, I didn't even call the function. Darn it. <clears throat> so in here, I'm going to say foo s. See? Foo, in, 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 that one is 8. In main is 1,000. Why? Because it just passes the address of that 1,000 into a variable. That is a pointer, and a pointer is always 8 bytes, depending on if you are running a 32 or 64-bit platform. OK? Are we good with this? All right. And still, you'll see you've got to use size off to measure the strings for some reason. OK, so in here, it's going to be EF. Sorry, I didn't give you a break. Size off. So if you have to go, go. And this is just for the alignment. So um, it's the exact same uh, example that I had over there that I'm having over here, but dealing with alignment. So it's printing all the good stuff that you're supposed to. So it goes through every single thing. Close the address of every single thing that you have, then you add one to it. So, so if I have A as an integer and I add one to the, uh, to the number, what the value is going to be, well, what the value is going to be, then I have a P that is a pointer I have. And these are all numbers, exact numbers that I am putting inside the pointers. So A is holding this number, P is holding this number, Q is holding this number, R is holding and C is holding this number. Okay? So plus plus when you do, it adds the size off to it. Alignment tells you where is the next valid place to put it in. They might not be the same. Like if you have a structure that has three doubles in it only, it could sit in an address. Its alignment is eight because it can sit at anything that is a, 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 a multiply of eight, right? Because in that case, but if you change one of those things to something else, and, and yeah, you know what I mean. So, so it not necessarily size of an alignment are, are the same. So, so yeah, so let me just go through it step by step so you see it quickly. I do. How did you see that? OK, I know. Where is my? So these are all the, so all these things, they have the exact same values inside. I add one, and one will be added to A. We all know that. But if I add one to P and Q and R and C, each one is a different address. P is going to be 8, Q is going to be that much. So as you see, each one, depending on what is the size, that's going to be that. And you can see the alignment is actually 8, but the value that is being added is more than that. So alignment, what is a value, proper address that something can be in, but uh, size off is where the next value can fit in memory. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So that's pointer arithmetic, everyone. Please go through this like go through it step by step and see exactly as you see size is 16, but alignment is 8, and so on and so forth. Go through this step by step and try to understand exactly what each statement's doing. That's gonna make everything crystal clear. Again, has nothing to do, oh, uh, yeah, uh, these are all C stuff. It's not um, size of and stuff. Where do we return when we return? Get changes? What the devil is that? Where do we return when we return? Oops. Uh, I'll stop the program, but that doesn't need, uh, anyways. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait, I, I pasted it in the wrong place. Copy. 
So when you write something like this, where did that return statement go? It goes to the operating system, exactly. It goes to operating system. How do you access that? Each uh, has a different thing for it. Like, for example, in Windows, percent error lever percent. If you echo that, one, two, three, four, five will be shown. So after the program is executed, you can ask the operating system, what was the return value of the, of the program? With that, you can create, uh, give options for the system admin to do precautions based on the way you ended your program. Okay? So that's why we have a return statement to show to the OS what happens. For example, in your submitter, how do I know submitter programs that you run? How do I know if your compiler was successful or not? It returns a value. I check that value of the compiler, and the compiler tells me if it was an error in there or not. You got it? So that's, what I have. that's how my submitter is knowing if your program had an error warning or not. All right? So uh, you can test this, and, and after this, do echo percent, error level percent. In Windows, I think it's in, in Linux. I have a very resourceful person at home in Linux. That's why I don't never remember anything. I always ask her. Um, it's, I think it's dollar sign something, or I don't know. There's something in, in, in Linux that is the, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's, uh, it's an environment variable in Linux that you can actually get the return value of the last. Uh, a program. So that's, so it goes back to OS. Pardon me? Do, dollar sum question mark? There you go. Dollar sum question mark. Thank you. So dollar sum question mark. The funny thing is I actually use that many times, but I always forget. Dollar sum question mark in Linux tells you what was the return value of your last executable, okay, in the current thread, okay? So that's that one. EFGHI. So we talked about this before, so again, uh, don't use define statements ever unless you are using for macros. And if you have no idea what a macro is, then don't use it for now, okay? All right? Don't use define statements unless you're using it for macros because it makes your program extremely unreliable and meaningless. This is a program that runs. And if I run this program, the output will be one, two, three, four. So this program runs. Why? Because that first half says for this, the rest says that. The final statement is nothing but the search and replace when it's not used as a macro. Okay? In a macro, you can actually have a smart uh, search and replace. But we'll talk about macros later. So don't use the find statements. Like, especially if you do something like this, integer pointer like that, and then you create something like int ptr over here, then the first one will be pointer, but the second one will not be. Okay, don't ever use that. Always use type def for that. So, no define unless for macros. Keep that in mind. Just trying to fill in the blanks. Yeah, so as I was mentioning, instead of using defined statements like that to make your program more readable, use type def. We've already talked about type def. You know what it is. When you say type def, int pointer, int ptr, int ptr becomes actually a type. So when you say int ptr, p, and q, they are both pointers. 
not first one pointer and second one regular variable. Okay? So using type def is always pref preferable. Or preferable. <laughs> JJK. So that's, uh, what is that? Uh, type defs. What else? I already talked about what is the point of type def. I don't need to explain it, right? When you have very long types you want to do over and over, you do type. <clears throat> we talked about how structures can be made with a type def when you don't want to. Remember that? Like, like C language. So C language. Use, because in C language, structures are not types. To actually make it a type, you can do it like this. So this could be a C language using type def to actually make a student become a student. In C language, if you didn't want to repeat saying struct student something, you could have done this. So this type def becomes that student. So remember that. So this is going to be, I'm going to say type def in CK, JKL, type def in C dot C. Uh, all right, let's say I want to copy a memory from one place to another. Am I going somewhere you're extremely tired? Should I stop and continue the next time? Nobody said no. Okay, these are all yeah, good stuff that we need to know. Let's say I want to copy a, a memory from one piece to another. If I want to do that, what is the smallest size of address, smallest addressable unit of memory. A character. That was in C. In real thing, it's a byte. Byte, character, potatoes, potatoes, right? So that's that. All right. So if I want to actually copy a piece of memory, for a chunk of memory to another chunk of memory, uh, the best way to do it would be to actually write a function like this, right? So copy memory, character destination, constant character source, and I start from one, go to another, up to a size. So any piece of memory I have, I can copy to another piece of memory, right? I just start from the beginning. So I can treat everything as a piece of memory, simply like that. So I can, I know it's crazy, but I can have a double value and I can copy one double to another double, but it's a little difficult because first I have to cast the, the address to a, to a character pointer. Otherwise, it's going to tell me what the heck you're doing. You're, still, it's going to tell me what the heck you're doing, but anyways. So uh, I have to cast the address of the second double to a character pointer, address of the first double to character pointer. Now I know what size of is. I'm going to say size of double, which means how many, but whatever bytes that is, it, it blindly copies the first byte to the next one and it keeps going like that. Therefore, B will hold the same value as the other one. And as you see over here, the value is actually copied correctly. You see that? Okay, that's copying a memory from uh, one, uh, one place to another, which is kind of troubling for me. Yes. No. Yes, I am sending the address to mem. Then square bracket does magic for me. OK? OK. I could have done this, but then it would have kind of This would work too. We don't want to do it though. It's, it's the exact same thing. No. No. Two different copies. Two different addresses. It's copies from that address to this address. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to confuse the heck out of everyone. 
but that's essentially the same thing. Instead of putting an index in front of it, I'm adding to the value of the pointer. So it goes next, next, next. It's the same thing, right? Or if we have done this, that's the same too, right? This is essentially a translation of this one, OK? Anyways. Which brings us to a special type of pointer that it is an address, but it doesn't know what is sitting in the tar target. You can create that type of pointer in C language. That type of pointer is called a void pointer. When you create a void pointer, you're essentially saying, hey, it's just an address and got no idea what type of address is. That takes the burden of casting off the shoulder of the user of the programmer. So I can actually do this. So I can actually uh, get the thing, change my copy mem to this, and do the casting myself. So I'm going to say void destination, void source. So these become pure address. Because they are pure address, I do not need to cast anything. Anything is an address. I don't need to cast it, right? Because it's pure address. It doesn't have a type. I don't need to cast anything for it. Then. I do the casting myself so the caller doesn't need to. So I'm going to say character destination is that one, character is that one, and then I'll do the same thing. Are we good with this? Are we OK with this? So that's what void pointers are good for, to be able to access a piece of memory without knowing what is at the target so I can manipulate it any way I want. OK? I can actually go to an address, deal whatever, do whatever I want to do with that address. Obviously, I could have written it like this, which is uh, much more uh, OOP345-ish type of a thing. So I don't have to create extra variables, right? Just break that void and cast it and then put the thing in front of it, right? So I cast the destination to a character pointer, then I put the index in front of it. Potatoes, potatoes, right? Are we OK with this? All right. So this is uh, a void pointer. So it's copy uh, lm, uh, copy mem using void pointers. Any questions down? To, yes. Run it again. You don't believe me? <laughs> tell me, tell me. I don't believe you. I don't, I don't mind. So run this again. So I have to, the one with the void thingy you said, right? So well, why you want me to run it again? That's the out. The out has a mind of its own. If I didn't want to, I had to say, first, it's fixed. Secondly, it's how much. <laughs> OK. C out has a mind of its own. C out, C out prints the best way that it found fit. We are not losing any precision. It is perfectly good. I just, it just rounds it. Now, I think this is the first concept that we are going to uh, talk about that it comes to 3, 4, 5. L value and R value. What is L value? What is R value? You've already used it many times. You know exactly what an R value is, what an L value is. I'll give you an example in two seconds, and you'll say, ah, uh-huh, OK? So, an L value is something you can actually put at left side of an assignment operator. 
And R value is something that you can put at right side of an assignment operator, not at left side. And L value can go to the right side, no problem. But R value can always stay at right of an assignment operator. Are we okay with this? Okay, let's try it and see what the heck I'm talking about. So, so if I have integer i and I have an integer pointer, let's say p, and I can say over here i is set to 6, right? i is set to 6. There is no problem with this. Um, I can say p is set to address of i, correct? Right? They're all good. No problem with this? Can I say address of i is set to p, address of, uh, I don't know, 2, 3, 4, 5? You can, because that is an r value. That value cannot be put at left. Can I say, can I say 6 is equal to i? That's an r value, you can't do that. Okay, I'm going to show you more R values as we are going. Do we understand this? It's very obvious. And you will see that soon um, that uh, we have so we use so many R values that we never actually notice they are actually <clears throat> R values that we are using. And C++ has a way of distinguishing what's coming. To, it actually can recognize if what you are passing is an R value or not. And that saves humongous in a few minutes. So <clears throat> let's take this nonsense out <clears throat> when I did that. So <clears throat> if I create a function like this, OK, I can say i is set to value, right? Any problem with that? No, it returns a value, and the value that's returning is 10. So we are all good and fine and dandy. But I cannot say value is set to i. Correct? Because value is an r value. Are we okay with this? Now, let's say I have <coughs> a file scope variable over here. <coughs> Something like that. All right? or <coughs> something like that, okay? And then I create this, I'm going to say double reference tax value, and I say return tax. So I can, um, I can easily say C out tax value, And it will run perfectly, and I'm going to have a tax value printed for me. We good with this? Are we OK with this? But the good thing is that now I can actually do this. And that's perfectly OK. Because tax value is a L value. Why? It returns the reference of a tax. Therefore, tax value becomes an alias for the tax. Right? So now I can go see out tax, or I can go see out tax value. The results are the same. Are we okay? Are we okay? The class ends at 35, right? So probably I have to end it at 30 because I have a class in five minutes and I have to take everything and go. So, and I didn't give you a break, so five minutes you can. And since you didn't do the quiz, you're happy, so I'm okay too. <laughs> Okay, so this one is uh, uh, LMN, 
L value, value, and R value. .cpp. You gotta obviously go read all these things because I'm just giving you quick examples to give you kind of an idea of what the thing is, but uh, to actually go through it and see uh, what's going on, you need to actually, okay. Now, how do we actually detect if something is L value or all value? Take a look at this. If you put one reference, what you're going to receive is an L value. If you put two, that's an R value. OK? So if I actually run this code, you will see that if I run this, you will see that it's going to say L value and R value. So you can detect if something is an R value or not by passing two ampersand. So passing two ampersands receive an R value. So what it does, instead of passing the reference, it assumes its identity. It becomes it. OK? And it's a very interesting concept that we're going to deal with it soon, OK? Which is the basis of rule of five. You had rule of three. Who has the microphone? <laughs> what, was, what was rule of three? <laughs> OK, rule of three, copy constructor, copy assignment, Virtual destructor, right? These are rule of three, correct? Okay, rule of five says copy constructor, copy assignment, virtual destructor, move constructor, move assignment. Which says, why do we, why we do this? When you are passing an R value, a temporary object, an R value, into something that is supposed to copy it, it's a temporary value, and it's going to die. Why copy? I can just assume its identity. And don't let it get copied. Just get its guts, guts and destroy the shell. It's as if, so <clears throat> a copy constructor, when you have two cups of, you have, you have a cup of coffee, you want to copy it. It literally creates a second cup of coffee where the first one is still full. It doesn't happen in real life, right? That's why we are getting closer to real object orientation. A move constructor says, you want to copy this copy of, cup of coffee? Yes. Puts it in here. The first one becomes empty. It just gets the content. They are both cups of coffee. But because you're, you're about to throw this away, it's an R value. You don't need it anymore. I'm going to get the copy inside. Coffee inside. I'm not going to create a new one. Yes, sir. We'll come to it soon. I'm going to come. Like, that's a very, very deep. It requires me to actually teach them. And I have exactly minus one minutes to do that. So we'll go out. When you come back, we're going to do the rest. Thank you very much, everyone. Have, you see, have a beautiful day. See you ah, online on Monday. That's a good idea. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll do, probably the next day you're coming here, I'll do two quizzes. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Don't worry. It'll be fine. I'm going to do one quiz, but content of both.